Hello and welcome to Bull with the Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 5, Episode 17, titled World of Trouble. <laughs> Wait a minute. In case you were wondering, where's the free fall? Huh? Assholes? Where's the free fall? You did Victims of Circumstance last week. Where's the free fall? Just a reminder, we are doing the lost episodes before getting the free fall because of story continuity. There are portions in the lost episodes that as they were written, they were supposed to air before free fall, but NBC cut the season short by three episodes and then decided not to air one at all, had a phone in so that you could people could vote for the episode they wanted to replace it. And then that was all after Freefall had come out. For story continuity, as was written in the writer's room, we are going with lost episodes, forgotten episode, or canceled episode, and then Freefall. Freefall, the, the finale. Now, and if we're being honest, these episodes that we're doing have a little bit of an asterisk because they were aired on USA. Aren't the best episodes. Like, that, like they... they clearly picked the ones that they didn't like the most to leave out of the season <laughs> i'm not saying that they hosed usa in any way but um they <laughs> didn't give them uh they got one the over gems <laughs> <laughs> yes well this episode premiered on june 14th 1989 it is written by raymond harding who also wrote Line of Fire, and he was the story editor for 16 other episodes in season five. So he's all up in season five. The director is Alan Meyerson, which all day I've been going, Ryerson, bing, like from Groundhog's Day, <laughs> but his name is Meyerson. <laughs> <laughs> he's got one more episode coming. His two episodes got put into the lost episodes. He was not welcome on NBC. Yeah, apparently not. <laughs> They're like, no, you don't get any work. <laughs> I wonder if he was, like, banished to USA for the rest of his career. <laughs> Stuck writing episodes of La Femme Nikita and her notice. Dope stockings. <laughs> Before I get started, I can check in see what you lives. Pals, as we record this episode, it is our one and only John's birthday. Happy birthday, John. Happy birthday, John. Thank you. He is a bright 51 years <laughs> old. <laughs> So of the three of us, John is the most invested in music. So if you'd like to wish John a happy birthday, email us, go with to gmail.com and let John know what deep 80s albums he's missing out on. He'd love to hear about those. Obviously, you've heard his voice oh, a lot about oh, music. Yes. He's attempted to convince me to listen to Meatloaf, which hasn't happened yet. I did promise, but I haven't done it yet. He'd love to hear those yes. 80s deep cuts. You've got to. So, and speaking of which, I'll give you a little something else. I mean, if you want to check out a, an album that's going to change your opinion of a band that you thought you knew, check out Beach Boys' Pet Sounds. It is so different from anything Beach Boys you've ever heard. Interesting. It also says it was released as an LP and a reel-to-reel -reel tape. I wonder if I could find a reel-to-reel -reel tape of that album. That would be awesome. Yeah, because I'm looking through all the other albums, and all of them are released on as LPs, except for that one. Pet Sounds is released as a reel-to-reel. I'd seen it get referenced all the time as like this like monumentous album it is such a fantastic album. I always thought like, oh, it's the Beach Boys. Like, you kidding me? Like Kokomo? No, like apparently this is a different Beach Boys that was ever on the radio. Interesting. You might have to check that one out now that I'm paying for Spotify and forced to listen to music occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> Dominic is the old man of the group as far as music goes. He listens to like talk radio and podcasts all the time. As far as I'm concerned, that's none of my business. <laughs> <laughs> that music stuff. <laughs> And of course, pals, if you'd love to wish John a happy birthday, you can email us, go with you to gmail.com, or you can go harass him on Twitter and interrupt his Chiefs draft coverage. <laughs> You're going to get a lot of that for the next couple months. <laughs> Speaking of people and birthdays, I can think of two people who aren't going to have another one, and they <laughs> both have the same last name as Lombard. <laughs> this is an interesting episode. I can't wait to break this one down. I'm um, also happy to see Al Lombard back since he hasn't been here for four seasons. Let's go break this one down. When we open up, the duo are going to like a, is it a federal building? It might be, I think it's like the DEA, FBI kind of building. No, it's, or that, it's, it's that science it's, building. It's that company? The okay. science company, yeah. That's going to make security make a lot more sense later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're there to discuss it, some It's like a big meeting of a bunch of big cops, which makes me wonder why Tubbs and Crockett are here. I thought that 
too. Shouldn't Castillo be there? <laughs> They're complaining that you know Castillo's not in this episode at all. He wasn't in the last one either. He's not mm. in the. I don't think he's in it, hardly any of the lost episodes. Crockett is like, well, we're wasting our time. I don't know why we gotta be here. They go upstairs. You run into a man named Hanley. He's like, I'm glad you guys came. I really want you guys' feedback on this weapon. Outside, a suspicious catering company, which every company should know, like always suspect the catering company. It's always them. Always. They're the easiest ones mm-hmm. to be able to get in. You see someone ha- holding a tray of roast beef, you're not going to stop them. Like, whatever, go on in. <laughs> it's those jackets. That's what gives it away, those short jackets. <laughs> Does that say something about the catering industry? Uh, are they just a bunch of unscrupulous people? <laughs> They're loading up their full armory yeah. into the roast beef and sandwiches and <laughs> in the cups of milk and whatever have you. Like like every weapon you can think of, they're piling it in there. And meanwhile, inside the building, there's an intro from the man who created the weapon. His name, his name is Fowler. He says it's essentially a stun gun called Havoc that can debilitate a car without hurting the passengers. But also, it can destroy the car. Yeah. Um. How does that work? How do you destroy <laughs> the car but not the passenger? <laughs> It shoots, it shoots lightning bolts. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's how it. Someone asked about that too. Like, it shoots a lightning bolt. How are you gonna keep people safe? He says, "Well, you have to, you know, you have to tune it right. Like, to make sure you don't overdo it." That guy thought he was really funny by asking that too. He was really gonna get up there and ask a real funny question, and everyone laughed too hard at it. <laughs> so right after they make a point to say how happy they are that Tubbs and Crockett are there, and that they really value their opinion. They really want to know what they think. Please don't kill us. Their input is so important. <laughs> I just, why are vice cops input so important with this gadget? What are the vice cops going to use? Of, oh, I, I, never mind, I take that back. They're going to shoot down all those helicopters that thwart <laughs> all their missions all the time. <laughs> Which, speaking of helicopters, we're going to talk about some helicopters later. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so everyone's getting nice and comfortable. They're getting ready to watch the demo. And then suddenly the armed caterers come rushing in. They shoot out start just massacring everyone down on the ground unfortunately all the police officers up in the viewing booth are helpless they can't do anything except, except for Tubbs and crockett the other ones all ran for cover and like you know pooed themselves in the corner <laughs> oh no that guy that asked, gunfire the guy that asked the funny question thought he was a smart ass where's he at no nope. <laughs> this is the lamest bunch of cops and security guards i've ever seen this is a a cop conference but cops in the crowd the only two people to respond to a shooting one flight stairs below them are tubs and crockett like no wonder they're so valued sunny's able to get off a fantastic shot from the stairwell and be able to shoot the man that's on the back of the van because they they run in grab the weapon shoot out kill a whole bunch of security guards and police officers jump in a van that's parked out there as the demo and then drive away crockett get nails one he dies but they get away with the weapon and they even use it to disable one of the police cars that are chasing them and then they escape. Now, before we move on, I have a couple questions here. One, all those police officers upstairs, no one can get a shot off. Except None of for, them tried. Except for, except for Sonny. Sorry, there was one next to them and he got killed right away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> shot right away. <laughs> <laughs> Two, wasn't there a security gate? How did it, they just gave up there's a whole lot of quit in that police force like they didn't try and like trap them <laughs> yes. right this security they could have trapped them in there too hey, like to get out they got in i do want to give security i do want to give security some credit here you see the two guys running after the van who got yes. shot Those like security they're guards. probably getting paid minimum wage and they're chasing the van down <laughs> while all the other cops are just standing in the window <laughs> i also want to say that the guy that got shot by crockett deserved it why he is hanging on to the back of the van instead of climbing in the van, <laughs> I, know. Uh, I have no idea. So, but at the end of the day, it was a success because technically it worked, right? Yeah, they get away. They even got a sweet ass van out of it. <laughs> and then we go to the opening credits. Before we move on, let's see who's in our this week's guest stars. There are a couple of familiar faces, John. With new beards. <laughs> <laughs> This episode is a party of former guest stars, and, and most of them have played multiple different characters in different episodes. I'm just going to run through the repeats, and then we'll get to the, the three actual guest stars. So let's start off with good old Dennis Farina. He plays Al Lombard. You would know him from the episode One-Eyed Jack Lombard. He's our former Chicago cop. He was Michael Mann's police consultant. He went on to star in Crime Story and Law & Order, other Michael Mann, Dick Wolf series. He's a 
familiar face. Also, a familiar face to Vice fans should be Julie Brams, who plays Rita Lombard. She also played Miss Frank Hackman. That was actually her acting debut in the episode Deliver Us from Evil. And she played Sandy Dyson, Asian Cut. So the actress who played the wife so nice, they hired her twice. (laughs) And to her credit, they actually gave her a first name and a speaking part this time instead of just shooting her. So good for her. (laughs) Moving up in the world. Must have really impressed. She would go on to do TV show Perfect Scoundrels and TV movies Company at Dark as a mark for murder. Dominic, you already mentioned Ned Eisenberg and his nice fake beard. It's an amazing he play- fake he beard. Plays- it's a tubs worthy fake beard. <laughs> he plays Federico Labrizi. He was also in the episode Lombard. Obviously this one. He also played Charlie Glide in the episode Yankee Dollar. Once again, multiple characters. But at least this time he's back to play in Labrizi. Yes, and um, Labrizi oh. has grown up. He's not sticking his pinky in people's ice creams anymore. (laughs) He's sticking it somewhere else. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. I almost missed one. He also played Sal uh, Castelli in the episode The Last Madonna, which was like literally four episodes ago. He he did some pretty big moves. Primary Colors, Million Dollar Baby as far as movies. Most known to us as the Law & Order staple defense attorney. Doesn't matter. Law & Order, anything. SVU, Criminal Intent. He's the defense attorney. Ah. Like, might as well just be Weasley defense attorney. (laughs) And I'm also just going to throw it out there. Even though they were co-star credits, technically, Mark McCauley and W. Paul Brody both make the episode. This is Mark McCauley's fifth Fifth different character in his fifth different episode. This is W. Paul Brody's third different character in his third different episode, among others. Oh, they mean to be like, this is third different character in two episodes. (laughs) He played two different characters in one episode. In four. Okay, so to our new guest stars, we have... Tim Quill, who plays Sal Lombard. Some of his other notable roles are Private Joe Bolesky in the movie Hamburger Hill, which is actually his Mm. acting debut. And he would follow those roles, that role, up in the movie Hiding Out, then Next of Kin, and then eventually Argo, which Argo, pretty good movie. It won an Academy Award for Best Picture. Yeah, but then he's also got to say he was in a movie with Ben Affleck. <laughs> as far as TV goes, he had a reoccurring role as Lieutenant Mason Painter in the series Jag. His funniest credit that I found was he was an additional maniac in the movie 2001 Maniacs. <laughs> <laughs> He was an additional past the 2001. So played in, <laughs> and unfortunately, he passed away of cancer in 2017 at the age oh, of 54. Wow. Our next guest star is Vincent Schiavelli. He plays Lawrence Fowler. He's a character actor most known as playing Mr. Vargas from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Oh, now I know that. <laughs> Also played Mr. Vargas, 1986 TV version, Fast Times. So uh, apparently they made like a TV show after it too. I'm going to say something controversial. Don't you say it. <laughs> I've never seen Fast Fast Times at Richmond High. Well, you're going to watch it this weekend. <laughs> John's going to say he's never seen it too. I know. <laughs> it's like, what? I've seen it either. No, no, I've seen it. And I, I think when I was in high school, I think I was a... Kind of the Spicoli of my high school. <laughs> I love Spicoli. A good way to put it. I, I, I very much related to him. So. Yeah. <laughs> Other roles he's played. Uh, he also played the Subway Ghost in the movie Ghost. Lots of um, uh, Patrick Swayze up in the guest star. Yeah, I know. Next again, Ghost. What's going on here? I knew oh, when yeah. I saw him, I was like, John's going to have a bunch of movies. Cause I know he's in a bunch of stuff. Like, you don't forget that guy's face. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a very distinct look. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I know I've seen him in a bunch of stuff. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to Luca Berkovici. Berkovici. Nailed it. <laughs> plays Hans Weitzer. He's an American filmmaker, director, writer, producer, and actor. Very accomplished. He's based in Budapest, Hungary, because that's where all the best films are made. <laughs> of course. <laughs> that's where all the John Claude Van Damme movies are made. Hey. <laughs> it, well, and this him. one's going that way. 
Not 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 exactly Bob Van Dam, but just just follow me here. He's directed eight films, the most notable being Ghoulies, which is a 1985 horror comedy. And it stars Michael Desparis, who played Murdoch in the MacGyver series and was also at one point the lead singer of the band Power Station. <laughs> So we're, we don't know who that is. <laughs> so it, apparently Ghoulies was like a huge independent cult hit. So they made three sequels. By the way, he also co-wrote that as well as a couple of the sequels. Uh, so there, there are your guest stars. When we come back from the opening credits, we're back at the science building. They're cleaning up the scene. They get a wallet from the guy that was killed. And uh, he's a real dummy. They make fun of him a lot. <laughs> 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 and they say, like, well, he's got to be working for someone else. No one this stupid would do this kind <laughs> yeah, of invasion. <laughs> yeah, he's he also, clearly not smart enough to come up with this on his own. <laughs> he also must have had an inside helper. Hanley says, well, you look, guys, I'm like, we have a creek on this. And I know there's, there's a room full of police officers, but it'd be really grateful if you guys could take care of this for me. I think what the problem is, it was a room full of FBI guys. That's where the problem goes. Mm. He's See, FBI. They could, be, they could be the insiders. Also, they're stupid and they're FBI. <laughs> they can't get well, anything that's, done. But, but they use them later to raid younger <laughs> Lombard's office, right? And that pays like off. Like the FBI is involved still. <laughs> yeah, and you can't see him hiding at the end either. <laughs> Why do we need vice cops for a robbery, guys? Like, seriously? And not even in this jurisdiction, vice cops. If they're here on vacation, vice cops. <laughs> like, were the find- hookers are involved in this robbery in any way? No, but there was weapons. And they were there. So. <laughs> <laughs> they did find a mooring slip, so they're off to investigate that. It's got a really high number, so that means it must be at the end where, like, all the big, expensive yachts are so i watch it from a restaurant and they just happen to see hans weitzer or weitzler weitzler a slime ball sonny knows all too well he knows every slime ball (laughs) he's a major arms dealer so it's no coincidence that he's here and then of course another boat comes pulling up and they see it's sal lombard that's going up to go talk to this arms dealer. Hmm. Pretty, pretty bold of the arms dealers to just park at the dock like that. I know, and then also meet on the poop deck. <laughs> you were waiting for that, weren't you? <laughs> Don't you know what they do on the poop deck? <laughs> Not called that for fun. <laughs> Maybe it's called the poop deck because the arms dealer about poops himself when Sal tells him. That because his boy Johnny died, he owes him an extra 100K. <laughs> He's real being a good guy. And that's what the whole story is here for the Lombard show, this whole episode. He, Sal's being a good guy. His boy Johnny got killed in that deal, which who knows what he was thinking was going to happen. They were going to break in with a bunch of police officers, shoot up the place and steal a weapon. Well, he blames White Soul and says like he should have known that that was too much. He didn't understand that that what he was going into is what he's saying. White Soul knew it and he set him up. Like that's what he. That's why he. Yeah, but whose him. idea was it for to on to the back of the van? <laughs> that was all his. <laughs> so now that the vice team has seen them or seen Sal, they're gonna go like monitor him and see what's up. The duo and Hanley are hanging out. They're surveilling Sal from like across the street, actually hiding. Like they were hiding. really hiding yeah, this yeah. time. I thought that was good. I'm like, look at those guys. They're finally getting it. <laughs> <laughs> they're talking about Al too. It's like he's dead. It's really interesting to see what Sal is up to because Al just disappeared one day, and we all think he's dead. Yeah, but Crockett's really—he's got this. I mean, and it's hard to remember all the way back. His, from the original Lombard series, but Crockett seems to really, really like Lombard now. Uh, like he almost talks about him like, like he's not so bad. I was like him for a while. <laughs> well, if you remember at the end of that last episode, they did get close because they were taking care of him. And he told them like how he feels bad because his son had seen him all the crimes he's done. And, and Crockett's like, I have a son somewhere too. <laughs> I don't I think, I think I, his name's Sal too. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you have a son named Sal? I have a son named Sal too. So yeah, he basically he like connects with him because they take care of him. All the oh, of course, all the while Lombard's like just reeling him in <laughs> to pull this big yeah. heist on him. <laughs> Upstairs, Sal is coming into his dark apartment, turns on the lights, and there's Al waiting for him. 
and they just hit it off like they never missed the beat. Sal says, I thought you were dead. I thought I'd never see you again. And they're like, hey, I'm here. Okay, cool. What's your dinner? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I love his dad too, too, because his son's like, how are you here? Won't LaBreezy, you know, kill you? And his dad says, ah, oh, LaBreezy's a pussy. Like 10 years ago, <laughs> I would have I would have taken him out, but I'm retired now. Yeah, I'm not worried about any of that stuff. What are you up to? Oh, oh, you deal on finance and real estate. Oh, I'm just so proud of my boy. How can I be more Italian? No, hold on. I'll hold my fingers up. <laughs> I'm so proud of my son. <laughs> he would be more Italian if he had six me. Of spaghetti. <laughs> while he's yeah, dead. exactly. I was going to say, excuse me while I go make a, uh, go make a plate of spaghetti now. Exactly. <laughs> That's going to be a great quote on a card. Speaking of food, (laughs) as this is happening, Stan's delivering sandwiches, a good delivery boy. (laughs) Al wants to know when he can see his grandson. Sal says, I don't know, Rita doesn't like you, so probably not. Yeah, Um, I mean, it's not like Rita doesn't have a reason. (laughs) We thought you were dead. (laughs) Zane delivers that food. Sonny says, I prefer you on skates. And then Stan says, well, fuck you. I don't like your hair. Yeah, I love that. He's like, I never liked your hairdo. <laughs> it was like, I don't think that was part of, I think that he just came up with that line on his own. That was not part written in the script. He's like, I'm not going to be working with you for much longer. I don't like your hair. <laughs> yeah, bit, and there was there's definitely a little bit of tension because as soon as they see Al come out, they're like, call Stan and tell him to do our job. We're going to go follow dad. <laughs> Well, Tubbs is the only one working, and he sees through his <laughs> monoculars. I mean, it's only a single <laughs> ocular, so uh, I'm going to call it a monocular, because they can't afford binoculars. <laughs> so also, my, my favorite part is when he's, look over, look, you want to look, and Sonny's, where do I look? <laughs> um, the same direction I was looking. <laughs> the front door? <laughs> Towards the door? <laughs> Just they stared see, at the sandwiches. Where? <laughs> <laughs> they see Al Lombard leaving. They can't believe their eyes. Confirms that not only is he still alive, but that, you know, all this other stuff that they've seen, they'll talk about later with like Lebrici's men mm-hmm. dying and stuff like that. Like, okay, this makes more sense. Maybe we should have been paying closer attention. But they're not going to make an arrest right there. They're going to wait and do it later. So they follow Al and then Stan follows Sal. Sal. Who just happens to leave right after his dad leaves. It's like everyone's leaving at the same time so they do a pick up al and they take him back to the uh police headquarters of the, the jail and they're going to do an interrogation with him he says or al says i've been all over the world and i was you know, vacationing it's, it's a great vacation i was fishing <laughs> hanging out he, he's such a mob gotta go to morocco the best hookers hand to god <laughs> <laughs> door opens and al's lawyer comes pushing in past gina Demanding for Al to be released. So we did see, we, we see them both in this episode. And they talk, both of them. Mm-hmm. We see the girls later. They open a file. <laughs> <laughs> Tub says, no way, we're not releasing Al. He's wanted, he has warrants. And the lawyer says, actually, he doesn't. And Gina says, yeah, he's right. The judge lifted both the warrants last month because of his failing health. And then he said, it's a miracle that when I got back, I felt so much better. <laughs> Sonny gives him a warning, says, don't even jaywalk, pal, or your butt's going to be mine. Which doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> now the next day, down at the marina, Sal and Al are talking. Dad is just swooning over his son and how successful he is and how much money he's got and how great of a life he has. And Sal starts to come clean, but then he gets a beeper. Like a beat, he gets beeped, you know, that thing. Yeah, beeper. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it'd take too long for us to explain to the to, to the young crowd what a beeper is. <laughs> he runs over to the payphone and calls Fowler, says that the FBI is at the lab and that they know someone inside has helped them. And so now Fowler is freaking out. Sal says, okay, fine, come meet me where I am. That way I don't have to travel anywhere else. Come meet me here. <laughs> At the river walk. Sal Sal is pretty laid back for a guy who just threatened an arms dealer. I mean, just (laughs) taking a stroll with his dad. Oh, don't worry about the FBI. Like, just come meet me down here at the dock. I'm hanging out with my dad. All the while, Al is suspicious of what's happening, and so is Stan, who's doing his duties out in his dinghy. (laughs) About about 10 feet off the dock in a Hawaiian shirt with big ass binoculars (laughs) on a boat. Stand up with like, binoculars. Sal goes and talks to Fowler, and Sal tells him, calm down. We're going to take care of it. You're going to be rich beyond your wildest dreams. Just trust me on this. Fowler leaves, and then Al pops in and says, there's something suspicious going on here. Whatever it is, stop. It's not worth it. Whatever you got going on, it's not worth it. Sal says, 
what the hell are you talking about? I'm just like you, and you're a liar and a thief too. So yes, take all that, true. Dad. Yeah, and <laughs> hey, on a side note, hey Vice, Vice, enough with the it's your fault, Dad. I'm like this because of you. We've heard this is like the fifth or sixth time we, we we've had the spoiled criminal kid telling telling his dad, I, I do this because of you. Can't there be any enterprising neglected children? <laughs> <laughs> everyone who not spiteful <laughs> everyone who writes for vice has daddy issues that is established right because crockett's got daddy issues <laughs> yeah <laughs> apparently then suddenly a gunman appears on the bridge above them the police say police and then take a bullet <laughs> and, and the shooter aims down and tries to shoot al but sal throws himself in front of his dad gets shot and dies in his last breath tells him about there's a package at the post office well just well, for the record if i'm with my father and someone's gonna shoot him in my head i make the immediate age deduction and say it's actually probably better if he dies <laughs> which is exactly what i think my son mm-hmm. would do to me <laughs> sorry old man you've had yes. your time <laughs> the assassin are really bad assassin i mean he takes the cop out and then he takes the kid out but then he leaves like dad's still just sitting there wide open. Yeah, I know he could have shot. shot. I thought that too. You, I'm like, you okay, fired two bullets already. A third's not gonna get you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You already took out the cock. Uh, I don't know. Get him while he's leaning over, all <laughs> distracted. Later, the duo are there talking to Al as they're cleaning up his <laughs> son's body. <laughs> and all they saw was a partial on the license plate of the car from the shooter. And Sonny's like, that's good enough for us. Yeah. We don't go kill on a killing spree. Let us handle this. We got a K and an R. Yeah. Tubbs <laughs> is like, I think we could get him. Maybe. <laughs> but because we got maybe partial. I think we could do it. I think we'll be okay. We don't need Someone to said there might be an eight in it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Lombard thinks that it's Labrizi who came after him. And I thought, oh, the twist is going to be, it's actually the arms dealer that came after him. No, no, it's actually, it is Labrizi. It's exactly <laughs> what you think it would be. But in the very next scene, Frederico, you guys suck. I gave you 50 yes. bullets, you fired three. <laughs> <laughs> also, look at this stupid beard I'm wearing. <laughs> These guys are the worst mobsters. This is like the... Th- Three stooges of a criminal enterprise here. He's got these two knuckleheads who can't figure out how to kill Lombard. And then here he is. He's paying Lombard's bail and keeping him out of prison. Isn't it supposed to be easier to kill someone in prison? Like, I thought <laughs> that's what TV had told me. Yeah, it'd be way easier like to you get him just, in jail. That even happened to Sunny one time. Like, it's even cheaper. Like, all she is like $10 and a pack of cools. <laughs> Back at the precinct, Stan gives Sonny a sketch of the witness description of the man Sal met with. It is unmistakable. It is Fowler. Oh, my God. Yeah, right away. Right away. <laughs> I've seen that face before. Back at Sal's former place, I guess his apartment. Hold on. Wait a minute. I didn't put this together before. He's got that big ass house. That's not his apartment. I didn't want to say anything when you were saying that it was going to lead to another discussion, but that's his office. Oh, okay. That's an office okay. building. That's not an apartment building. Oh, uh, okay. That makes more sense. Be like, it's a or, giant or, office or building. Or does, does he have a second place? The first scene with him and his dad is his office, but that's not the office that was being raided by the FBI. He does have a future. Well, maybe he did have a future in real estate past tense. <laughs> I was trying to figure out why he's why he was so damn rich. Because when we go to meet Rita here, she's in a big ass house, upper upper class. <laughs> because he's a gangster, so making money illegally and doing. Which is why I think it's, But that's also why I think kind of weird that she has attitude because clearly she's been benefiting from his son's criminal enterprises <laughs> but she has an attitude because he's gonna get him killed <laughs> but did you see that pool yeah <laughs> <laughs> real fast al is going through his son's stuff at the office he finds the paper for the package at the post office he swings by the post office and says can i get this package in true post office form the person behind the counter is not my problem. Well, I mean, he was trying to get a package yeah, no, that was no. already shipped. Like, how do you do that? He's like, w- where did this package go? She's like, I don't know. Find out where that person is. Like, that's not my job. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't care the air. Post office still don't give a shit. No. <laughs> and then one more fast scene where they, the duo, pile into Fowler's car and they corner him. They're able to find out from him that he feels like he got cut off from the company because he made, he he made, made the weapon. Yeah. He invented it. It was his brainchild. But the company says it's there, so they're going to make hundreds of millions off it because it's a military weapon. But he got a $5,000 bonus. He got a 
in our bonus. Yeah. That's works for that company. Like that's how that works. If you invent something at a company, you don't get to keep it. It's a conspiracy. But I think he was saying he didn't invent it at the company. He was doing it like in his own time. That's what he was trying to say. Like he was doing it like not at, not at work. He was just doing it, and he came up with it. And he's got two teenage sons. Come on. No, no, it's it's a conspiracy by the company to screw him out of millions and make sure that his sons live in squalor. Yep. <laughs> well, Sal promised them two hundred thousand dollars, which forever on two hundred thousand dollars, by the way. Money yeah, I was. mean, problems were ended. <laughs> it's you, you can tell the difference in in the time period because two hundred thousand dollars back then it was I'm gonna feel good about the amount of money I have. Two hundred thousand dollars now it's like I guess Wells Fargo might give me a loan as a, if I use this for a down payment. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on my eight hundred thousand dollar house, this might you know count as a down payment. Also, two teenage sons that eat that two hundred thousand dollars in like a month. <laughs> <laughs> And then what you're talking about, John, we stop at Rita's house and Rita tells Al to get lost. And uh, no matter how much he wants to be a part of Tommy's life, Al calls his lawyer and says, make sure you've given Rita money, to, but she won't take it if it's from me. And the lawyer says, okay, fine, I can filter it. Pretend he had an insurance policy. It's like Lionheart, the movie. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Everything always goes back to JCBD somehow. <laughs> Let's jump to Tweedledee Tweedledum screwing up another hit on Lombard <laughs> real quick. The two morons are heading in with guns drawn to kill Lombard. You see him. He's just sitting on the couch watching TV. Then when they get there, he's hiding away around the corner. And he pops out and doesn't even you think like he's just going to pop out and surprise them and stuff. Pops out, lets them know exactly where he is, and then gets in a gun battle with them, but still kills both of them. Afterwards, one of the dying hitmen gets it out of them that it, it's uh, breezy. So then we jump to the next scene, and this is what I want to focus on here. The moron screwing up the hit, that's not surprising. Did he rent a helicopter <laughs> to drop the dead hitmen into the breezy's pool? Because that, that's, that's epic gangster right there. <laughs> Like, loaded up the dead hitman in his car, <laughs> drove down to the airport. Put him in the And I'm assuming paid a pilot to take him, or did he rent a I thought that, I'm like, is he flying the helicopter himself? Because, like, who's going to be like, yeah, sure, I'll drop that dead body for you. And what's the conversation like when he's loading the dead body? Hey, sir, I, I, I thought this was just for, like, a tour. <laughs> Like, no, we're this guy really wants to go swimming. Fly over this specific <laughs> house. No, hover over this guy's <laughs> house for a few minutes. <laughs> Out at Weisler's yacht, Labrizi shows up. He's like, hey, strangers, you got a nice boat here, but your, <laughs> but your staff are ugly. So what's up? Why'd you call me out here? And Weisler says, you and your petty feud with Al Lombard killed Sal and my access to the military-grade weapon that I wanted. Now it's your job to go find that military weapon for me, or you will pay the price as well. See you later. All the while... So what makes, what makes the arms deal so much more threatening than... The breezy, who's supposed to be a big mobster, and why did he walk into in in like eight circles? Like I was so dizzy at the end we of this scene. About that too. Like I'm getting dizzy watching them go around. Like I don't know where they began and where they ended. Like where were they before? Is that like a power move? Like if I get him real dizzy, he won't realize that he's also a gangster and shouldn't be afraid of me. Well, he's not a very good gangster though. So they're terrible gangsters because. Yeah. They map out the entire... And he's like, down a few hitmen, apparently. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> they are terrible gangsters because they list out everyone who's involved, what they're doing, the timelines that it was happening, and in, in turn also put in all the threats that are mixed up in this for who's going to do what and yeah. everything and timelines. Stan, out on his hidden dinghy out in the harbor, hears <laughs> the entire conversation. And then he's dinghy away. And he goes <laughs> to the precinct to place the tape. And like I said, it's everyone's name their role, what's happening, when it happened, and what's going to happen next. Case closed. Go arrest them. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the dinghy to the rescue. He heard the entire conversation between these two yahoos. <laughs> One thing they don't have is yeah. where the actual did weapon all is. the work. He did all the work. The police even come in and open the file and agree. Case closed. They got him. They didn't need Labrizi or Weitzler set up in order to get the gun either because Al was going to get that. I mean, yeah, I don't yeah. know how long he was going to take to get it though. It took 30 days to fill out that form. <laughs> <laughs> out at Rita's, Al just kind of walks into the backyard and yeah, goes, hey, creepy. what's up, Tommy? And Tommy's like, hey, old man stranger. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guy. Who's you want some candy, like little boy? <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> Grandpa's like, hey, I brought you a present. Tommy's, my dad's dead. <laughs> 
<laughs> like, so my dad's dead. You know that, right? Can you push me on the swing now? <laughs> Rita storms over, takes Tommy, and tells him tells Al to get lost. Like, You're not family. Get out of here. I never want to see you again. Al tries to protest, saying, you guys are the only family that I got. And I know that Sal didn't want me around because you didn't want me around. And she says, no, Tommy. Yeah. yeah, I don't want to keep you from Tommy. I wanted to keep you from Sal because Sal worshipped you. I knew he was going to end up just like you. And then when you reappeared, that's exactly what happened. Technically, he was already that way. <laughs> the duo have picked up Al outside of Rita's place and they're interrogating him again. Sonny is begging him. Do not go out for revenge. Let me do my job. Do not start a war on these streets. That is the wrong thing for Tommy. It's the wrong thing for Rita. Let us take down Libreezy and Weitzler. Sonny is making it very clear he is the only one allowed to shoot people in Miami. That's what I'm going to say. In fact, he... <laughs> All he has to do is wait it out, and Sonny will kill him anyway. <laughs> I love that he asks him for his word. Lombard even smiles and like sticks his hand out to shake his hand. He won't even shake his hand. Are, are you sure? You sure you don't want to shake on it, Sonny? No pinky swears? <laughs> sure you don't want to check and make sure his fingers aren't crossed? Like, you really got to take him on his word? What happened last time? By the end of the conversation, Alice agreed, but then reminded Sonny, remember, I'm trusting you with the health of my grandson. So, warning, do not this up yeah he should have never trusted sonny <laughs> at his lawyer's office al goes in to see him and says i know you're the one that ratted me out you're the only one who knew where i was saying why did you do it lawyer taps his little panic button underneath his desk with his foot and at the same time says you told me to get you back to miami i got you back to miami by having labrizzi be the one that bribes the judge i didn't realize that was gonna be such a problem <laughs> <laughs> totally thought you'd be cool with it <laughs> I was so disappointed to find out after everything transpired because the security guard shows up, does his job like that, and shoots Lombard. Like, that's a security guard doing his job, gets him, saves the lawyer, and then we find out that it's on act. It's all staged. They fake Al's death again, and they use him in his death to set up this deal that now they'll be able to get, they'll be able to be the ones to provide the gun to Labrizzi. When they do that, they'll bring him down, and then they'll use that to go bring down Weitzler. Very complicated. Way more complicated than what that wasn't complicated, what to yeah, if that wasn't complicated enough, I mean, all of that kind of means nothing. So they faked his death so that the lawyer would call Labrizzi, but they're hoping that Labrizzi doesn't bring the lawyer with them to the meeting because he's already seen Crockett and Tubbs, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The whole very shady. And also the, the, the fact that they're looking and they're talking to Lombard while he's supposed to be dead. See that big glass wall? Isn't the, <laughs> la isn't the lawyer on the other side of there? Like, can he not see through those glass cubes? Like That guy's supposed to be dead, but he's sitting up. <laughs> yeah, and they're faking Lombard's death. Lombard's grandson and his family safe. And, and then two scenes later, they're going to go visit his grandson yeah, while he's he supposed up. to be dead. <laughs> he's supposed to be dead. But, he drives up with a, with a lunchbox. Like, like, this is completely pointless. <laughs> Hey, if I know anything, the kids at the po at the polka dot nursery school can keep a fucking secret. Polka dot. <laughs> yes. It's probably the same one with that kid that was pumping iron. You don't mess around with that nursery school. Yes. <laughs> don't mess with those kids. No one will ever be as epic as that kid that was pumping iron. <laughs> Secretly, every time I drive by a school, I'm like, oh, look at those weaklings not pumping iron. <laughs> In a very touching moment in Vice that Al tells his grandson that he's leaving. He's not sure when he's going to be coming back. And Tommy asks him, like, are you going to heaven with daddy? And then he, his grandson's all sad that he's like, I don't want you to go, but I love you. And he gives him a hug. And Al's going to go. We know what's going to happen here. Al's going to make the sacrifice to he's kill Labrizzi. <laughs> but he did he didn't do anything. No, no, no. Well, don't What's know that hell? at that time. The kid says, are you going to heaven? And he's, no, you know. Him. Up until this point, he's supposed to go into witness protection. So he's technically, he's, he's going, he's not going anywhere near heaven. He, he's going to New Mexico, which is much worse, <laughs> but. So now to the final scene of the episode. We're down at these abandoned docks. The duo are waiting in the toilet cabana for their dinghy to arrive. I said <laughs> that word. favorite part when the door opens and they're in there together. And, like, look out. Like, what the hell were you guys doing in there together? This whole scene. 
<laughs> this whole scene, so them hiding it there. The 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 like three hundred cops that are just kind of roaming around, <laughs> pretending to hide, but like they want us to see them. Yeah, the police are involved, definitely. And then, everywhere. <laughs> and then the breezy and and their muscle whatsoever, like carpooling to the meet in the same <laughs> speedboat. Like this is great. <laughs> Also, when Sunny blows up the boat, I'm like, how the hell are they going to get home? <laughs> <laughs> A little excessive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like, okay, um, thanks for blowing up the boat we came in. What about all these abandoned ones that are sitting around? <laughs> Could you blow one of those up? In between the sounds of a Peanuts episode, they make this <laughs> deal. And Fabrizzi <laughs> is scared because he blows, Sunny blows up the boat. They do the money exchange and the duo leave. And I think they're supposed to leave. Then the FL come in that way. They don't place Burnett and Cooper as being cops. Yeah, they're supposed to like pretend like they weren't. But then out of nowhere, Al pops out and says, this is for my son. And reaches to his waist like he's going to get a gun. Fabrizzi shoots and kills Al. The duo, especially Sonny, who's now heartbroken seeing Al get shot, pull out their guns. They shoot and kill Fabrizzi. The FBI move in. They arrest the other people that are there. And they go running over to Al. Al, in his last breath, says he wasn't the one that killed Fabrizzi. He kept his, he word. Kept his word. And Tubbs can confirm. Like, he didn't even have a gun on him. He just popped out. And he says, he tells Sonny, make sure you tell Tommy you know, you, about me and like, you know, you t- like basically you take care of him. Yeah, he can't even take care of his own kid. He thinks his own kid's name is Tommy. <laughs> God, man, I mean, that's taken a hell of a chance. This is how much trust Lombard has in Crockett just randomly shooting people because <laughs> Lombard <laughs> pops up. Labrizzi could shot him and then given up immediately afterwards once Crockett pulled his gun. And any normal cop would have just arrested him and then Lombard dies for nothing because he's so trigger happy that he knew <laughs> that all he had to do was pop up and get Labrizzi to pull his gun and then for sure, Croc is going to waste them. He's going to put a clip in them. <laughs> That's what I was telling Dominic. If he would have just let him let them do the buy like normal, he would have wasted him anyway. Because as soon as they would have came in to arrest him, he would have shot everybody. The first thing he did was blow up his boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like this is not only did Lombard play Crockett. But he knows Crockett so well that he knew the whole time that all he had to do was show up and Crockett would murder this man. Sonny goes to walk away. Al is still hanging on, like in death, has a grip on his pant leg. Sonny peels it off and then freeze frame. And that's the end of the episode. And that's the end of, I mean, essentially all of the Lombards. Lombard. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it yes. literally is. <laughs> that's the end of the Lombards and I believe the Labrizis as well. I don't think there's any of them left either. Oh, thank God for that. Yeah, because as they mentioned earlier in the episode, Lombard made sure that anyone who was hunting him from the Labrizis got killed yeah good miami i mean was it what was it last episode that the the two people took care the two bad guys took care of them each other all the criminal organizations are wiping each other out they're not going to have a job pretty soon (laughs) huh suspicious they're wiping each other out right before the end of the show (laughs) well before we get too deep into that (laughs) (laughs) let's go look at this week's music before we get into that final thoughts about the end of the lombard story here um we have a couple music stars we'd like to talk about one new one one that's been here before shock that's season five in a nutshell <laughs> <laughs> let's go talk about this week's music john and the guest stars there was some fantastic names and i saw the bands who are in this week's music and there's more fantastic names i'm so looking forward to this music segment what do you got for us this week? Uh, let's just start out with the one we know, Paseo de Garcia, the Alan Parsons Project. We did a pretty deep dive on the Alan Parsons Project. The first episode their music popped up in, Red Tape. If you remember, the members of the Alan Parsons Project are obviously Alan Parsons and Eric Wolfson, who... who Give him credit, man. He was okay with him uh, with it being called the Alan Parsons Project. They're an English Scottish duo. Alan Parson was an assistant engineer and an engineer on albums The Beatles, Abbey Road, and Let It Be, as well as Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. In the mid 70s, he was working with some huge artists. And Wolfson, who was a singer, songwriter, composer, and session pianist, basically came together and said, I think we can do this as well as some of those other acts, and that's how you got the Alan Parsons project, because Alan Parsons clearly had the ego. Clearly. (laughs) 
they would go on and make music. A lot of their music's used in movies, but we already talked about all that fun stuff. Let's get to the new music of the episode. We have Inspiration by the Gypsy Kings. The Gypsy Kings are a group of flamenco, salsa, and pop musicians from South France who perform in Andalusia, Andalusia, sorry. <laughs> This is getting good, John. I, I, I had it earlier, too. I, I nailed it before, before we recorded, and I knew I was going to screw it up. I was like, I got it now. <laughs> Andalusian Spanish. Although the members were born in France, their parents were mostly Gitanos, which is uh, Spanish gypsies who fled Catalonia in the 1930s during the Spanish Civil War. Even though that they were born in France, they were mostly Spanish, and from families of Spanish gypsies. They were known for popularizing the Catalan rumba. So the history of it is they were formed in the 70s. They are sons of the famous flamenco artist Jose Reyes. His sons, Nicholas and Andre, teamed up with their cousins, Jacques, Maurice, and Tanino Ballardo, Balliardo, and they amazing. formed Los Reyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, this is, this is painful. You and they the, formed the band Los Reyes. You have no so, choice. Like, you just backed into a corner. I have to say it. The dad, Jose Reyes, was part of a duo, a famous duo. And when he left that duo, he kind of basically arranged his sons and their cousins, kind of helped them form a band. That band, originally called Los Reyes, would eventually become the Gypsy Kings, mostly because they started out their career as kind of a gypsy band. They played weddings and festivals and just randomly in the streets at times. And because of this, they would have changed their name to Gypsy Kings. Now, their first two albums uh, would attract very little attention, but they would start to be hired by some of the upper class parties. And no joke in in the in their Wikipedia says to add color to upper class parties. Which I, I just think that that was kind of funny. <laughs> you know, color. I, I I get what they're trying to beat around yeah. there. <laughs> they ended up finding success with their third albums the third album the self-titled gypsy king <clears throat> originally they were popular through europe africa and the middle east but in 1989 gypsy kings was released in the u.s and it spent the first 40 weeks in the charts very few spanish-speaking albums have ever done so that that's pretty huge and they also covered a lot of pretty famous songs. There's a cover version that they did of Hotel California that was used for the Coen Brothers 98 classic, Big Lebowski. Mm. They also did cover version of I've Got No Strings for Disney for their Simply Mad About Mouse. They also did a cover version of, or a version of, You've Got a Friend in Me for 2010's Toy Story 3, but that was only released for their Spanish versions. So we're stuck with the Randy Newman version. The Spanish version gets the Gypsy King. <laughs> I am a slightly biased because I am actually very aware of who the Gypsy Kings are. I've actually heard Gypsy King songs. They are amazing guitarists. Their band is a mix of left and ha right handed guitars, and they're just insanely good. They are, even though I don't speak a lick of Spanish. I would go see them in concert if they ever came around. They are fantastic musicians. I could talk about albums and awards they've won in other countries. Just know that they are just fantastic guitarists and musicians. And if you like flamenco music, definitely look into the Gypsy Kings. So, yeah, and they're still I, strong. I don't know that much about them, like as far as like having listened to their music. But I know they're like their fans love them, and that is an understatement. And they have they have a serious hardcore fan base. I don't know enough about guitars to explain explain to you why it's such a big deal that the band's mixed of left and right handed guitars, but somehow like the two together is just insane. The sound that they make. John, I knew Alan Parsons' project. I didn't know that much at all about the Gypsy King. Well, let's finally go over and give our final thoughts on this week's episode. This is, again, one of the lost episodes. It was uh, over on USA for a reason. <laughs> so I'm interested to see where everyone stands on this episode. Let's go give our final thoughts. All right, John, set the barometer <laughs> for us here. Where are we at with 
this episode. Okay, so first, I want to give Vice a little bit of credit for finally finishing at least a storyline. I-, I know it's not the one everyone would have picked. People want to know about Baby Tubbs or my personal favorite, the pirates that are going to kill Crockett's family eventually. <laughs> there are so many storylines that are left unfinished throughout the show. The fact that they actually went back and closed the Lombard one, I give them credit for that. Now, that being said, it is just silly full of plot holes. It is so many unnecessary scenes. This whole thing could have been wrapped up in about 10 minutes. I appreciate the reunion of Vice actors really showing these guys his range playing their 12th character. <laughs> but just, just kind of necessary. There's so much silliness with the plot. Tubbs and Crockett almost necessary in this episode. Could have been anyone on the Vice Squad. Until we got closer to end, and then it, it came seriously became all about Crockett and Lombard and just how much Lombard owns Crockett. Like he is in his head as far as knowing how to control that man. Golf clap to <laughs> Lombard. Melissa, what are your final thoughts? This episode should have stayed lost. <laughs> <laughs> I can see why they didn't want to air it. I do enjoy having closure on Lombard. I like Lombard. I think like his story was good. I liked him. He's the ultimate gangster, right? He's like the old-fashioned gangster where they have like respect for everyone and they do all these things. Of course, he doesn't, but you know that's what they that's what they live their lives by. And I liked him, and so I didn't like to see that he died. But I'm glad that we finally got we finally got closure on somebody. From an, an older, we're always like, well, why don't they ever close it out? We they, they close it out, we're like, well, that was stupid. <laughs> don't close it out that way. <laughs> I feel like you can rent a helicopter with a dead body in tow and fly and drop it in someone's pool. I feel like you could kill that man at any time. And at no point do you have to sacrifice yourself on the off chance that a random undercover cop might shoot him afterwards. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the plan was flawed. Like, there's so many things could have happened. Like, you could have been shot and no one shot at Labrizi. <laughs> also, like I said, all he had to do was just let them go do the buy, and he would have been killed anyway because Tubbs and Crockett leave no one standing. <laughs> He's lucky he didn't shoot him with the with the, the havoc. So, obviously, I don't... It's not a great episode, but I like that we got some closure, closed it out, and the girls were in it. No Castillo, no dad, but, you know, that's okay. So, these, these lost episodes are a little weird, but it's not a terrible episode. <laughs> It could have been over had he had a little bit better aim with the hitman's body. Like if he had just dropped him a little bit more to the right. <laughs> well, I agree with you guys. I, I'm very happy with that we got a story closed out. And I would have been really upset had I watched Victims of Circumstances and then gotten a free fall and not had closure on the Lombard story. I would be very, very upset when I when this originally aired. And then to find out later. Like there, I could have had it. <laughs> there was a closeout Lombard story, and we just decided not to air it on NBC. But instead, we aired stupid Joey Harden episodes. They could have easily <laughs> swapped this for one of the episodes earlier this season. It would have been better. Actually, the season would have been better if they would have done that. Instead, we got the Joey Harden episode, and we're going to get another one of these lost episodes. But that's that disappeared for a reason. <laughs> they could have swapped this because it's timeless. It doesn't tie into anything else. There's no, like, this thing had to happen before yeah, this no. or anything. They could have put it anywhere except for, like, the first episode after the Amnesia arc. So they they could have put it in there anywhere, and it would have been it would have been made the season better. I don't know why this ended up being a lost episode, other than I think it was just the in the unfortunate position that I was late in the season. Yeah, probably. Growing increasingly, as I've never seen Miami Vice before, so in these final episodes, I'm growing increasingly concerned that A, we're not going to get to the bottom of Tubbs Jr., and B, Zito's ghost isn't going to make a return. And I'm really very disappointed in Miami Vice if Zito's ghost doesn't make a return. Of all shows, there should be a ghost episode. Yeah, well, I hate to break it to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Zito's ghost. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Chucky <laughs> Stone, <laughs> Caitlin. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> we're now we're done watching that episode. And that's going to do it for us this week on Go with the Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. Email us go with the heat at gmail dot com. You don't really want to get your hate mail for not doing free fall. <laughs> so. so if you don't like it, too bad. No. <laughs> We know it may not be the most popular decision to do the Lost episodes now, but we felt like it would be just out of place to have a Valerie episode and close out the Lombard episode after, you know, everyone quits the Vice team and everything, you know, just kind of writing on the wall what's going to happen to people. 
That's what I'm saying. If you have to put something in the comments, uh, put who your favorite additional maniac in 2001 <laughs> Maniacs is. Be sure to check out that website. Go to heat.com. Check out all the ways to subscribe, all the ways that you can contact us, all the ways that you can support us. Support step number one. Email us gold at gmail.com. Support step number two. Go to your podcast, your platform of choice. Write a review and go ahead and write a real review this time for the show. I'm not going to tell you to do anything silly. We only have four episodes to go. We would love to see your feedback on these episodes as we look to retirement. You know, it's like a retirement party and you get all your coworkers around that's supposed to say all the nice things about you that, and how they like to work with you. And then when you leave, they're like, oh, thank God I don't have to work with him anymore. I can, I can actually get my work done now. <laughs> We just like, you know, have those public comments so that everyone knows that this, you know, this show was okay at some point in time. <laughs> it was just okay as it could be. <laughs> Let me just put it this way. We got to be better than a Rastafarian popsicle. <laughs> right about how much better we are than a Rastafarian <laughs> popsicle in those podcatcher reviews. <laughs> so we'd love to see your review. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear what you think of the show. With only four episodes to go, we've got three of our lost episodes and then free fall. And we'll be to the end of Miami Vice. So that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal. I just uh, something I saw on Twitter today. My boyfriend asked me what I think of when I think of a mongoose, a small rodent animal, and he got all sad. And I was like, well, what do you think about it? He goes, a Jamaican goose. <laughs> <laughs> don't make you where that was going right away he's like laughing i love those kind of jokes because it's like it's so dumb how come i didn't think of this before like mm -hmm. you hear the setup like, i already know where yeah, that's exactly. going i should have known this already yeah exactly <laughs>